And this, this sort of this worldview uh, is, is really uh, depicted quite dramatically in the recent movie, The End of the Line, that's just been showing in New Zealand uh, in the beginning of this year. Then in 2006 came the ultimate paper. Uh, uh, this one I know made the, made the BBC evening television news because it, it argued and claimed that all fish would be gone by 2048 if we didn't change our ways. And this paper got enormous pushback from the uh, scientific community who works in fisheries and just said that's just silly, that, that many fisheries in the world are well managed, and yes, some places may continue to get worse, but some places are getting better. As a follow-up to this paper, the uh, lead author of the paper, Boris Worm, and I were on an American radio show, and I discovered that he wasn't this horrible monster, that, uh, uh, but seemed like a very reasonable guy. I'd, I'd never met him before, and we started talking, and we decided to put together a team representing the entire uh, spectrum of from, from very green marine ecologists to people who work in hardcore fisheries management, and try to understand why we had such different perspectives about the status of, of fisheries. And so we, we got money from the uh, uh, National Science Foundation funded institute to meet four times and we put together a team of 21 people representing literally everything imaginable from people who work for the U.S. National Marine Fisheries Service to uh, people who work in Daniel Pauly's group funded by the Pew Foundation. And we produced a, a paper last summer in, in uh, July of 2009 that summarized our work. And what we, what we, Boris and I initially agreed upon and then the group agreed that was the way to go, was to look at places where we actually could track the abundance of fish. Um, m almost all the earlier work, whether it was uh, the, the, the Worm 2003 paper that said all fish would be gone by 2048 or Polly's fishing down food chains, used catch data that had been assembled by the FAO. And, and they assumed that the catch represented abundance. So if catch went down, abundance went down. And we said, well, let's go back to places where we actually track the abundance of fish, either by surveys, uh, scientifically designed surveys, or through the complicated process of fishery stock assessment. And what we attempted to do was assemble as many surveys and stock assessments uh, as we could find for the entire world. Uh, now in the end, we really ended up with the developed countries of the world, Europe, North America, Australia, New Zealand, and a few other places. What we found was that through almost every ecosystem we looked at, fishing pressure had been reducing in the recent past, so that with only a couple exceptions in Europe, the amount of fishing pressure was at the levels that would produce in the long term maximum sustainable yield. So in other words, the fisheries management systems were working uh, to reduce fishing pressure to get it to the levels that it should be. Some systems showed, uh, to me, surprising rebuilding. Uh, one that particularly surprised me was New England, which uh, had always been the whipping boy of American fisheries, and the biomass of large fish in New England has been growing quite dramatically for the last 20 years, and the reason is because of dramatic catch reductions. And those catch reductions looked like collapsing stocks if you look at catch, but when you look at the abundance, whether it was by surveys or by uh, stock assessments, the abundance had been rebuilding. We also found that three areas, uh, Alaska, southeastern Australia, and New Zealand, had never been systematically overfished. Some individual stocks in those areas had been overfished, but as a whole, those ecosystems had managed to avoid the systematic overfishing that characterized the North Atlantic Ocean. Still, we found that about two-thirds of stocks were still below the target levels that would produce maximum sustained yield, that further rebuilding uh, was needed. But perhaps more interestingly, we found that about 15% of the stocks we looked at were, were quite badly depleted, that is, below perhaps 10% of where they would have been in the absence of fishing. When we looked across the range of cases and said, well, why are these fisheries that are rebuilding doing so well, uh, we basically found that there's no magic bullet, that there's nothing simple like ITQs or marine protected areas that led to success, that in every case we found fisheries Im quality improving, uh, it was because there was a strong central government that had been able to implement a whole range of techniques, not just one thing, but they were catch limits, 
effort limits, uh, gear restrictions, uh, and a lot of closed areas, not marine protected areas, but closed areas, temporary closed areas to protect spawning fish or to protect juveniles or something. The second uh, big result, uh, I would say, is that when you fish at a level that produces maximum sustained yield, you reduce fish abundance by a lot, on the order of 60 or 70 percent. And some species get depleted. And there is no way around that. If you want to catch fish, there's going to be fewer fish in the ocean. And given that most of the world's fisheries involve some kind of mix of species, uh, the less productive species will be overfished at times that you're maximizing the sustainable yield from all the stocks. Now you can moderate the, the ecosystem impacts to some extent by fishing a little less than produces maximum sustained yield and by technological innovation, uh, but the idea that you can somehow catch fish and have everything uh, in the ocean in good shape just doesn't seem to be possible. Uh, and there's a trade-off between ecosystem impacts and yield. If you want to have no environmental impact, you can't fish. That's simply the facts of life. Another important lesson from what we, we did in the, uh, this group that Boris Worm and I organized is we, we really couldn't say anything about Africa and Asia, that none of those places had databases on abundance. So we, 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 you know, our conclusions are not worldwide conclusions. They're specific really to the, to the countries we're able to look at. So I wanna, that, that's sort of the, what we uh, found in that group. Uh, you know, New Zealand comes out looking pretty good. Uh, you know, certainly there are some stocks in New Zealand that are at lower levels than you would like, but overall New Zealand's never gone the, down the pathway of the North Atlantic of overfishing. Fishing has received an enormous amount of criticism from uh, environmental groups and uh, with particular emphasis on the impacts of bottom trawling and uh, as, as many of you probably know, uh, the Canadian chain Loblaws has stopped selling hokey under pressure from environmental groups, even though hokey has been certified by the internationally recognized body, the uh, Marine Stewardship Council, as a well-managed fishery. And part of this is just the, uh, the, 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 the hatred that environmental groups have with bottom trawling. And if I might just read a, uh, a quote here from, uh, from Greenpeace's website, uh, enormous bottom trawl nets are dragged along the seafloor, catching all marine life and killing all habitat. They swallow and destroy everything in their path. And that's the kind of worldview that's led to, uh, to Loblaws not selling hokey.